Government's understanding of Order 36, and we welcome Deputy Pierce Doherty, please. Before I begin, I want to welcome Tisha the good news um, overnight with the DUP's decision to end the boycott of the institutions, and hopefully now we'll see the executive of the Assembly in the North and South institutions up and running before long. As I'm sure we can all agree in this house. Tisha, to tell you the year of Rini or Frice Racing Day, can art no a Hisu, I guess Martian Hain Yachet or Foyle, I guess Tasha, Comer and Schiel and Eschkol and Realtis, Don Carubian and Ye Kille, and Ye Chipomlan, a Yenner and the Sprachne, a Vilokashi Saku, Ohio Priceney, or Tia Racing, the Price and the Racing Day, or Hia a Hogal. I guess Kin Foyeshin. Uh, a generation of workers, Tisha, as you well know, families and young people continue to struggle to put an affordable roof and secure roof over their heads. And under your government, the housing crisis has gone from bad to worse, with sky-high house prices, rip-off rents and a severe shortage of housing stock, again highlighted in research published yesterday by Sherry Fitzgerald Auctioneers. And people who work hard out there, people who have done all the right things to create a good future for themselves and their family, are crying out for affordable homes to rent or to buy. And we've come to the bonkers situation, Tisha, where a couple now must be earning €127,000 a year to be able to afford a new average house in this city of Dublin. But it's not just a problem in this city. In Galway, you must be earning €115,000 a year, and in Cork, it's €104,000 a year. This is just off-the-wall stuff, Tisha. It's totally demoralising for people uh, right across the state. And many who have rightly have the aspiration of home, home ownership are instead forced to remain trapped in private rental market where they fork out huge amounts of money on rent every single month. So these workers, their families and the young people need real solutions, Tisha. And the best solution is for the government to drive with ambition the delivery of affordable homes to rent and to buy at a level that the scale of the crisis demands of it. However, last week, Minister Dara O'Brien published the so-called housing report, housing progress report. 44 glossy pages, lots of words, lots of numbers, but very little information in relation to the delivery of homes for which the government is directly responsible. Incredibly, Minister Brown failed to provide a progress update on the 3,550 genuinely affordable homes to rent or to buy that your government promised to deliver through local authorities and approved housing bodies last year. Not one word in the report about it, complete and utter silence. And you can see why this rings alarm bells, Tisha. Because since you came to office, or since this government came to office, your government has missed its affordable housing targets, not just one year, but every single year. For four years in a row now, the targets have been missed. And the targets were far, far too low for starters. The lack of pace, the lack of ambition, the lack of urgency to deliver affordable houses has serious consequences for people. Thousands of adults who want to strike out on their own are living at home with their parents. They're in their 30s or in their 40s. And as we know, young people are leaving in their droves for a chance of a better life, flocking to places like Australia. And Tisha, the housing affordability crisis is a real barrier for employers hiring workers, schools hiring teachers, hospitals hiring nurses and doctors, and the government and housing ministers needs to come clean with the people. So the ministers hiding behind the numbers of ho private homes that developers are building, many of which are totally unaffordable, many of which are still being bought up, snapped up by the vulture funds. But when it comes to uh, to, to own up and tell us in relation to what the government is directly responsible, there is complete silence. So can I ask you, Tisha, and the question is straightforward, will the government meet its target of 3,550 affordable homes that you promised to deliver through affordable housing uh, bodies and local authorities Remind last year, to... or will last year be like every other year of this government that you will miss those targets once again? Thanks, Stephanie. I, I, I don't have those numbers available yet, but I think they will be available in the next couple of weeks. Um, what I want to acknowledge, Deputy, is that rents uh, are very high for far too many people in this country, and that a lot of people uh, are waiting far too long to be in a position to buy uh, their own home. It is something the government is helping with. Uh, take the rent credit, for example, um, worth €750 Euros per renter per year this year, €500 Euros last year. A lot of people claiming that, helping them with the rent. Uh, and of course, we have the new uh, form of cost rental housing 
a form of public housing which allows people to rent at more affordable rates uh, and that is really taking off now uh, and is proving very popular and we're going to see a lot more of that uh, being built around the country in the coming years. When it comes to first time buyers, helping them with schemes that you want to abolish like help to buy for example, uh, like first home and that is making a huge difference. We saw figures out only in the last couple of days which showed that the number of first time buyers drawing down their first mortgage is at its highest level since 2007. Uh, that's an extraordinary change from where we were only a few years ago. In 2007, I was in my 20s. We're actually back to that now. Uh, those are the kind of numbers that we're now seeing people buying their first home, and that is really encouraging. And we've also seen a big uptick in the number of new homes being built. Uh, over 33,000 new homes built last year, and that doesn't include <coughs> derelict homes brought back into use, doesn't include student accommodation. Uh, so we're now seeing uh, numbers that we haven't seen in 15 years uh, in terms of new homes being built and first-time buyers at a level that I haven't seen since I was in my late 20s and that's really encouraging uh, but of course I acknowledge uh, that we're catching up uh, on a period where that wasn't the case and we have a big deficit yet to close against the backdrop of a rising population. Uh, I do need to mention two things you said Deputy because uh, I think it's important in this house um, that we're honest uh, around the issue of housing and that we're accurate around the issue of housing. This is a sensitive issue, a lot of people are hurting and they don't need misinformation uh, from the opposition uh, or from any other quarter. Uh, you said a couple must be earning €127,000 a year to buy a new house in Dublin. And again, that creates a false impression. First of all, that particular survey which you refer to refers to three bedroom homes only. It refers to new homes only. Most first time buyers don't buy new homes. Uh, they buy <coughs> second hand homes for the obvious reason that they're less expensive. And many first time buyers uh, by two beds, not three beds. Uh, so again, you're picking a particular example uh, with three different caveats, and then you're trying to make out uh, that that is uh, the case for everyone uh, when you know it's not. That survey also made the assumption that people can only borrow 3.3 times their income. You know that's not the case anymore, uh, and didn't take into account First Home, the government scheme which closes the affordability gap uh, for so many people. Uh, and I think uh, you, created a, you created a false impression there, and you shouldn't do that, and you shouldn't have to do that, Deputy, quite frankly. And again, you push this narrative uh, that enormous numbers, huge numbers uh, of young Irish people uh, are leaving Ireland to go overseas um, because of the housing crisis, and that's a one-way street. Of course, it's not a one-way street. Uh, we know that uh, while 80,000 Irish citizens left Ireland to live abroad for lots of different reasons in the last three years, 90,000 came back. And we know that if we look at places like Australia, look at cities like Sydney, look at cities like Melbourne, look at cities like Canberra, the house prices, income to ratios are much the same as they are in Ireland. First of all, I did mention that it was new house and I talked about an average three bedroom house. So let's be clear about this here. And I also said that it's unacceptable because I genuinely believe that it's unacceptable that you have to be earning 127,000 euro to buy a new average three bedroom house in this city. I think it's unacceptable that you have to be earning over 100,000 to buy in Cork, where your minister beside you is, 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 is sitting. We have an affordability crisis. You didn't mention that the CSO talked last week about the fact that house prices have gone up another 10% in the last 12 months. And that's the reality, that there is a generation, there's a sizable amount of people that feel locked out of the housing market. You may you know, dismiss the fact that 21,000 young people have left to go to Australia last year. That's just one area. They're going to Canada, they're going to uh, London, they're going to elsewhere. And some of them have done what young people have done before them, to go for adventure, to go for experience. But there is a sense that people are locked out, that people have to put their life on hold because of the runaway house prices that your government has overseen. Now, you ask you a simple question, you just bat it off, oh, I don't have that information. This goes to the core of it. What you're responsible in terms of delivery of housing is social affordable homes. You have a target of 3,550 homes to be delivered last year. You produced a 44-page glossy Deputy, document please. without a single utterance of whether you have Thank failed you, to meet Deputy. that target, the same way you failed to meet the target Thank in every Deputy, single please. one of Time the three years preceding it. So, Tisha, can I ask you a question? Will you fail again to deliver on your target of affordable homes, just like Daryl O'Brien has done and your government has done in the first four years of this uh, uh, you in office? Tisha, please. Deputy, the statement that you made earlier was not correct because you didn't take account of the first home scheme. The whole point of the first home scheme, which the government has established, is to close the affordability gap, where there's a gap between what a house costs to buy, a new house costs to buy, and what a person can get in terms of a mortgage. And if you take into account 
uh, the first home scheme, which thousands of people are now using, which you want to abolish, uh, it is possible uh, for people on incomes below 175, 125, 7,000 7, euros, or couples rather, uh, to buy those homes, uh, which, which you mentioned. And it's actually there, it's even in the survey if you choose to read it, there's a little asterisk where it says, doesn't take account of the first home scheme. People are using the first home scheme all over the country now to buy new homes, and it's wrong that Sinn Féin and the left want to abolish that and take that opportunity away for first-time buyers. In terms of our housing targets, Deputy, uh, over 30,000 new homes built last year, the highest in 15 years. First-time buyers, 500 a week drawing down their mortgage, the highest we've seen since I was in my late 20s. That's what we're now seeing in the market, more social housing. Uh, than any year since the 1970s. We don't have these act figures yet in cost rental and affordable we will, but I'm sure it'll be more than it was the previous year. Thank you. Taoiseach, uh, leader of the Labour Party, Deputy of Vanna Badgerk. Uh, first, I too want to welcome the good news of progress in Northern Ireland overnight towards the long overdue restoration of the Stormont institutions and the executive. Taoiseach, is he to hecht an chnav sparna is most astart? Ta gergal a nias mo to hecht aim shu agus a hogal go prainach. Ach tastian galor fein smachta quigashin agus nil ein dal chun kien ionav. Taoiseach, the housing disaster continues to dominate every aspect of Irish life. We saw last week the new figures on homelessness. Thousands of people, including nearly 4,000 children, recorded as homeless. Large companies like Ryanair now resorting to buying up homes at scale for their workforce. And some unscrupulous landlords acting with impunity. And we're seeing the health of renters and local authority tenants suffering due to poor conditions like mould and damp, with little action or follow-up from inspectors. Taoiseach, it's a core function and a duty of the state to vindicate the right of everyone who lives here to have decent, secure and affordable housing. But in allowing this housing crisis to deepen and to worsen, your government is failing to fulfil that duty and people across the country are worse off because of it. And I want to focus on the rights of tenants because we spoke last week, Taoiseach, at Leaders' Questions about the respiratory ill health of council tenants at Oliver Bond flats. But today I want to talk about the ways in which the state is also failing renters in the private sector. We're all familiar, all too familiar indeed, with the many cases concerning Luxembourg-based landlord Mark Goddard. And without commenting on proceedings against him currently in relation to unpaid awards by the Residential Tenancies Board, his other recent appearances in the news really underscore the need for stronger legal protections for renters. Tisha Goddard's tenants have faced the removal of essential furniture, like beds, like doors, to expedite the eviction process. Some were evicted en masse to facilitate letting through short-stay tourism websites. And others had to deal with the installation of CCTV cameras in their private living areas, an unimaginable incursion on people's privacy. Now, Tisha, it's true that some of these outrageous actions have already been dealt with by the RTB, and that's welcome. But the bravery of Goddard's former tenants in coming forward has prompted other renters to contact me, my Labour colleagues, and no doubt others in this House, who, to tell their stories of poor treatment by landlords in the private rented sector. And unfortunately, while all these experiences were stark, many did not in fact amount to a breach of our weak legal protections for renters. Taoiseach, our Labour Renters' Rights Bill would have addressed all these problems and more, yet your government refuses to pass it or indeed to take anything more than token measures to protect renters. Yet no one should have to live in squalor or in insecure housing. And so long as you continue to fail to deliver enough homes, more and more people will be trapped in rental insecurity. So Taoiseach, will you commit to urgently passing stronger legislation to protect renters? And will you ramp up delivery of homes? When will government act with the necessary ambition and urgency to deliver the Thank supply you, of houses that our people, our renters and all of those who are trapped in insecurity so desperately need? Thanks, um, thanks Deputy. Uh, and again, I want to join with you and uh, Deputy Doherty earlier in welcoming the news from Northern Ireland uh, early this morning that the DUP is willing to re-enter power sharing in Northern Ireland. Uh, this paves the way for democratic and dissolved government to be restored, the Assembly to function again, the Executive to meet, to make decisions for Northern Ireland, uh, and also, crucially, will allow the North-South bodies and North-South Ministerial Council uh, to work again. Uh, and 
Uh, many of the problems that people face in Northern Ireland are very similar to those that we face here, and it's important that they have a democratic and, and devolved government uh, up and running uh, to deal with those uh, very real issues. I had a chance to speak with uh, the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, earlier today. Uh, he briefed me on uh, the situation, and um, um, we agreed to continue to work together uh, on issues of mutual interest and mutual concern such as this. And it is hoped that uh, we can have um, the institutions up and running and the necessary legislation passed in Westminster uh, before the 8th of February. And I think that will be very positive as we enter the spring, uh, that there is uh, new hope uh, that the Good Friday Agreement can be working again. And I think we all agree that that would be uh, very desirable. Uh, once again, Deputy, I, I absolutely appreciate that a lot of people are suffering because of the housing crisis. Um, and that manifests itself in different ways, including renters uh, paying rents that are too high, uh, or having a bad experience with their landlords. Um, but we are making progress and we are helping. As I mentioned earlier, 33,000 new homes built last year, the highest in 15 years, and now 500 first-time buyers drawing down their first mortgage every week. Haven't seen that since 2007, when I was in my late 20s. That's how much it's changed in the past couple of years and how much progress we're making. And we're also seeing dereliction rates now falling and vacancy rates falling in part because of the actions this government has taken. Um, in relation to the matters that you raised, for obvious reasons, I don't want to get into individual cases when I don't know all the details, and I don't want to say anything that might jeopardise prosecutions or enforcement actions that are underway. Um, but in terms of what we can do to help renters, uh, we've already bring it, brought in the rent tax credit, uh, which is putting a month's rent back uh, into the uh, pockets of average renters. We've brought in new laws to extend uh, the terms that people are given, the notes to quit time, so that people have more time to find a new home uh, if they need to. We're also dramatically expanding cost rental, a new form of affordable housing, a new form of public housing, uh, where the government, in partnership with others, provides properties that people can rent uh, at affordable rates um, that are uh, where they don't qualify for social housing. And we're going to continue to build on that uh, in the years ahead. And we're always open to consider. Um, uh, ideas and recommendations from other parties as to how we can strengthen rent, renters, renters' rights, but we need to make sure that we get the balance right. Deputy Patrick. Well, Taoiseach, I welcome your comments on the likely progress in Northern Ireland, and I think we all do in this House. But in terms of housing, there's simply not enough progress from government, and nor is there enough ambition or urgency in delivery on housing. And I've listened carefully to your response on housing, and I'm glad you said you'll take opposition suggestions. Two years ago, we put forward a bill to protect renters, to provide for greater legal security for renters in Ireland today. Your government hasn't worked with us to progress that bill, and we're asking you again, Taoiseach, to do so, to ensure that we will see stronger protections for renters, because that is an essential part of addressing the housing crisis. And it's a crisis that is biting and is affecting every household. Every one of us has that experience of meeting constituents, people coming up to us in the street. It happened to me again at the weekend out canvassing. People telling us, I may be OK, but my adult children will never be able to afford a home in Dublin in the current circumstance. And that's what's driving people to emigrate. That's what's thwarting and stunting people's growth and development, growth and development of our young generation. Uh, and Taoiseach, we're simply not seeing the sort of delivery. We're seeing even, you know, on your own figures, just one in 50 of the 6,300 applications for the vacant property you, refurbishment Deputy, grants drawn down. And renters' rights that remain far time too weak. Now, so please. when will you act to ensure that we have stronger renters' rights uh, in law? And when will you revise up or announce those revised upwards housing targets? so we can see the necessary scale of ambition to deliver the homes we need. Thanks, um, thanks Deputy. Um, as I say, we're always happy to consider proposals for uh, new laws and new regulations, but any time we consider a new law or a new regulation, we always have to consider the unintended consequences, and we've seen that play out so many times. Um, when, sur when renters are surveyed, and you'll know this from the recent survey that was published, about 80% of renters say that they have a favourable experience. Um, but that still leaves 20% who have a bad experience, and that's a lot of people when you consider the number of people who are renting. Uh, particularly what we want to do with the RTB uh, is to make sure that the RTB is better at enforcing the laws uh, that already exist. And that works both, both ways, Deputy. I meet lots of renters who are very annoyed uh, with the RTB for not uh, enforcing the laws that exist already. I also meet landlords uh, who haven't received the rent for months, uh, whose properties have been damaged, who don't believe the RTB is working in their favour either. So we need to make sure that, that organisation is properly resourced and properly staffed. 
uh, and has the right IT system so that it can, can enforce uh, existing laws. And that's, I know, something the Minister is working very hard on. Thank you, Taoiseach. Deputy Carl Nolan. Corla. Taoiseach, last July during leaders' questions, and indeed several times since then, I have raised the backlog of 1,000 disabled applicants who are seeking a primary medical certificate. As you will be aware, the primary medical certificate scheme provides relief from vehicle registration tax and VAT, and is only is open to severely and permanently disabled persons as a driver or as a passenger. To qualify for the relief, the applicant must hold a primary medical certificate, which is issued by the Board of Disabled Drivers Medical Board of Appeal. However, this entire process was badly delayed when the board and its members resigned in 2021. Now, I do want to welcome the progress that has been made and indeed the intervention from the Minister for Finance, because the board has since been reinstated. That is certainly welcome and it's certainly one step forward, but there's many more steps to be taken with this whole issue. Unfortunately, one of the key reasons for the resignation of the board members, the previous board that is, was the ridiculous severity in respect of the eligibility criteria for a primary medical certificate. That caused much frustration and indeed is continuing to cause frustration. When I raised this issue directly with the Taunashta last July, he acknowledged that there was an earlier scheme in the 1990s which was far more broader and flexible in scope. He was referring to the Disabled Drivers and Disabled Passengers Regulations 1994, which allowed for eligibility on medical grounds of disabled persons who were severely and permanently disabled, including those wholly or almost wholly without the use of both hands or arms, or wholly or almost wholly without the use of one leg. This is the precise case of my own constituent, David Dygan, who has had his hand and much of his left arm amputated. But despite a number of attempts in applying for a medical certificate, a primary medical certificate, he's been denied it. And this is absurd. And you know, it's not right or acceptable that a man with such a disability, a lifelong disability, is being denied a primary medical certificate. David has spoken widely in local media about how the refusal of a primary medical certificate has forced him to the brink of poverty. Taoiseach, I'm appealing with you here today to do what you can around the whole eligibility criteria. The re-establishment of the Board of Appeal was a welcome and positive move. But all of that work has been under, undermined because of the way in which the eligibility criteria for a primary medical certificate is being applied. It's been applied with bureaucratic zeal that is contrary to our obligations around the rights of the disabled person. I just want to thank um, uh, Deputy Nolan for uh, raising this very important issue and I think we can all agree in the House that we need to do uh, all that we can to ensure that uh, people with disabilities have independence and have freedom uh, and can um, take up employment, uh, can use a car, can travel, can do all the things that uh, we need to do and, and they need to do. Um, in terms of primary medical cert, I, I don't have an up-to-date note on that with me, Deputy, but I will. Um, get you more information as soon as I can. Uh, I know the Minister of Finance is seized at the matter, has appointed new board members, as you mentioned, uh, and is trying to get through uh, the backlog uh, of cases that need to be considered. Um, and, uh, of course, we can review the criteria uh, to see if we can include more people. It's never, never an easy thing to do, because no matter where, where you put the criteria or what the rules are, there will always be people who um, don't qualify, uh, no matter what uh, scheme you set up. Um, but I take your point that uh, in some cases the rules are too strict and too harsh and perhaps they're being enforced too strictly. Uh, and I'll certainly discuss that with Mr McGrath. Taoiseach, I thank you uh, very much for, for your comments and indeed your commitment to pursue the issue further. I just want to add that you know we're talking about 1,000 applicants here and even if that number were to increase slightly, it wouldn't put the state under undue pressure. 
I believe that it's something that we can do, it's something that is achievable, and it's something that we must do in terms of ensuring that this state has credibility for supporting and upholding the rights of people with disability. I also want to ask Taoiseach if you would also take on board that there may also be an option. It's my understanding that the Minister could bring forward a statutory instrument and that that would resolve this matter. Again, I want to stress that we're talking about small numbers here and I believe that there is an onus on us now to deliver for those people. There's a thousand now, and even as I said, if it increased slightly, these people have been, I feel, unfairly treated, and, and they need their primary medical certificates, and it's only fair that they get them. Gareth Mockett. Thank you. Tisha? Thanks, um, thanks, Deputy. And I've come across one or two uh, not dissimilar cases in my constituency too, and um, you can have my assurance that I will follow up on this. Uh, Minister McGrath in Brussels uh, today, but um, I'll see him during the week and, uh, and uh, we'll try and make some changes to make things better. So you should, Deputy Councillor Connolly. Oh, sorry, Deputy Michael Fitzmaurice. Uh, Grimagod, uh, Ken Corla. Um, Tisha, um, in the last few months, we had seen in Middleton devastation caused by flooding and indeed, in fairness to yourself and the Tanishta, uh, Minister for Enterprise and indeed a whole host of ministers visited the area where businesses and families were being left devastated. Uh, extra funding was given. But long before Middleton, there's a place that your set nav didn't seem to find. It's encounter with Scammon called Loch Fuinchina. Um, and in fairness, uh, Minister for OBW and Minister for Agriculture visited it. But um, you or Michal Martin didn't seem to uh, hear about this place. It's called Loch Fuinchina in County of um, It's a place, and in fairness to the Junior Minister in OPW gave money and Roscommon County Council started work out of the budget in the OPW. Um, and so called Friends of the Environment, um, where an SSC is dying on its feet uh, at the moment, the trees are actually dying. But worse still, uh, Tisha, there is elderly people now being told or being, being spoken to by the council advised to leave their homes. Um, this is going on for years. Uh, these elderly people, in my opinion, in talking to them, don't intend to leave. They are going to weather this out. They are sick and tired of what's going on. In fairness to the minister, he put money there. We have a situation in this country that when we needed to put jet engines in for power, Minister Ryan was able, on the, and he came in here to the Dáil, the Bournemona, Bournemona, the legislation went through that in one week, that we were able to sign emergency legislation to bypass all European directives to make sure that we could do the works because our country was in danger of losing power. That was done right around this country. Unfortunately, the Minister at Arts Heritage and Gaeltuck didn't even visit the area where an SAC is dying on its feet. But are we at a situation that you as Tisha, that Michal Martin as Tanishta, and I don't blame the Minister that's over it because his hands are in chains between the courts down there and between EU legislation. You have met Ursula van der Leyen often enough. You know people in Europe, the, the, the head guy over environment was over here on the derogation. Have, what have we done to try and help those people, elderly people? Maybe you'd say they're out in the sticks. If this happened in Dublin, it would be sorted. But these people deserve better than what's going on at the moment. Ye have it in your hand that you can sign emergency legislation to bypass. It was done in the Carab gas field, if you look back. You have it in your grasp to sign that legislation to bypass those European directives, to save the death of an SAC or a so-called SAC, and to save people's lives. Do you know the solution up to now? Knock one house and move the people. Was up, Deputy that was the solution. Will you do that for those people? Will you help that minister there, in fairness to him, to get these people, to get this situation resolved for those people, rather than forcing these people to fight the height of water that's coming at them once again? 
Fisher. Um, I just want to thank, thank the Deputy for raising uh, this important issue, and I know he's raised it here before in the Dáil. Um, it is a very distressing situation for people living and earning their livelihood around Loch Fuinchina. Uh, I haven't had the chance to visit, but I am familiar with the area, as been raised with me personally by Minister Donovan uh, and indeed by Senator Dolan. Uh, Minister O'Donovan and the OPW and Roscommon County Council are working to find a resolution to this issue, and temporary defences will be deployed in the interim. Mr. Donovan plans to meet with the Loch Fuinchina Flood Crisis Committee on Thursday. Since the beginning of January, the level of the loch has risen by about 300 millimetres, giving an average daily rate of rise of about one centimetre. The level of the loch is presently 200, 325 millimetres below the road level in some areas. And the loch, if it continues to rise at this rate, could overtop the road and inundate properties in less than a month's time. To mitigate the risk of the road being overtopped and the flooding of properties, Roscommon County Council plans to deploy temporary defences along the top of the road. This work will likely need to commence in the next one to two weeks. In advance of this work starting, it will be necessary for the families of at least two properties to vacate their homes until such time as the lake levels are lower. The time scale is difficult to predict, but it could be in the order of four months. Officials from the Council have already engaged with these families and will help them in any way they can. I read that out. That was everywhere. Everyone knows what Roscommon County Council said. You didn't listen to the question I asked you. I asked you with the power that a government has. And bear in mind that when this case was being taken, internal documents reveal that the Attorney General was going to side on, this, on, on the part of the person that was taking the case against the state, against Roscommon County Council. Are you going to stand with your minister where the money has been put aside, where three quarters of the work has been done? Will you, or whoever has to sign it, be it Minister Ryan or Minister Noonan, sign that the emergency legislation protocol that is in year hands to do because you've already shown under the gas pipeline below in Mayo it was done. It has been done when the engines were being put in because the state was in danger of power. And this house didn't object to you doing that. Will you for the sake of saving lives? Because bear in mind, this isn't even about those people that's there. There are septic tanks now flowing into a turlock. Does the environmentalist believe that's good for it? Thank you, Deputy. There are slatted sheds going into the turlock. And you and Minister Martin have it in your grasp to talk to Europe and to sign this to get it going. Not talk about people leaving their houses, right. but get the few hundred the yards that has to be finished now, of please. this that that minister put the money together for. Thank you very much. Taoiseach, to conclude. Thanks very much, Deputy. Uh, I have to confess that I'm genuinely not sure precisely what emergency legislation you're, you're referring to. Um, I do know something about emergency legislation because I've been involved in this on, on a number of occasions uh, in government. And I know it's not just as clear cut as the government deciding that it wants to declare an emergency and bring, bring about emergency legislation and, and requires. Uh, a, yeah, yes, Deputy, but it's not as simple as the government just deciding what an emergency is and is not. Um, and 